So the boat's back in the water. We're presently anchored in the relatively sheltered Jackson Creek in Deltaville, Virginia. Uh, but I still have projects to do. Uh, one project is to varnish the mast. And not having a crane available, that means I have to do it from the bosun's chair, which is always a fun job. It's also always a fun job cleaning up all the varnish drips on the deck after I'm done. I always try to pick a relatively windless day to do it, but of course it always seems like whenever I go up to varnish, the wind picks up. Just like whenever I varnish something down on the deck, I usually get a rain shower about 15 minutes afterwards. So another project is to replace the staysail halyard. The old one was starting to get a little taddy there. So I just hoisted myself up on station and now I'm removing the seizing on the standing end of the old halyard. Get that removed. And then we have to seize on the standing end of the new halyard, which is a job that takes a little bit of time. And I'm never comfortable working aloft, it seems, no matter how many times I do it. I just always feel some anxiety being up there. But, as I said, without a crane to pull the mast out, uh, this is the only way to do it, so we do it. So I normally put three seasings um, on there, and this time I'm actually going to put four seasings, uh, which should be plenty secure. So I'm just finishing up the first seizing right now. And just finishing up that last seizing, and then I'll take the other end, the hauling end, pass it through the shiv and the block aloft, and then bring it back down to the deck with me, and we should be done. Uh, unfortunately, I made a mistake. I had tied off the standing end to my bosun's chair, uh, so it wouldn't run away from me while I was tying the seizings in, and I inadvertently put an overhand knot in it. So here I am moving the overhand knot all the way back down to the deck where I can clear everything. And then I'll have to go back aloft with the hauling end and reeve it through again. So I'm getting my exercise today. All right, let's get into this. So we look on the big chart here, and this is a great circles chart. Uh, so straight lines, straight lines are the shortest distance between two points on this chart. Um, and you can see, and you can see how much uh, going from Cape Charles from the Chesapeake to Bermuda and then across to Ireland, you can see that does take you a fair bit out of your way. And you can especially see it if, if you were in Maine. Um, going to Bermuda first would really take you out of your way if you were going to go to Bermuda and then across to Ireland. Um, so anyway, now I just uh, got an email from Bermuda Yacht Services. And the situation there, as of the 26th of May is that you can put into Bermuda, but you'll have to remain in quarantine, which just means that you can't leave the boat. 
Uh, they will bring out supplies, groceries, water, and um, any mar marine supplies, hardware, if you need to make repairs. So it's a possibility to stop in Bermuda, but uh, not... Uh, uh, not not, not going to be uh, much in the way of a vacation stop there because uh, I'll just have to sit on the boat the whole time so so anyway that's a possibility to stop in Bermuda now my plan here is uh, as we can see the Great Circle route goes right by C Cape Race Newfoundland and then across um, across to Ireland and the problem with that is we'll get into is unless I'm willing to wait to the end of June you have uh, the possibility of getting to uh, getting into ice around the south of Newfoundland here and also uh, gales get much more frequent as you, as you get up further into the North Atlantic so my basic plan here is to initially head east remember the, these are uh, latitude lines follow uh, follow around 36 37 north or so so originally just head east until I get about two or three hundred miles north of Bermuda and then take the great circle route across to Ireland and hopefully that'll keep us in warmer water so out of ice and also in generally more gentle conditions with a lower probability of gales um, so it's still going to add, it looks like about 150, 200 miles onto the passage. But if it saves me from getting into ice and gales, then it'll be worth it. Uh, so that's the plan. And uh, let's, uh, let's take a look at that in a little more detail here. Look at the Imray Isle Lair sailing directions for the month of June. West to east in the higher latitudes. Leave Bermuda for Europe or the Azores by early June. So early June is okay if you're leaving from Bermuda. However, if you're taking the northern route from Nova Scotia, or the Great Circle route, you want to wait until at least the last week of June. And go you know, two or three hundred miles north of Bermuda, and then take the Great Circle route across. And the total distance on that passage is 33, so say 3,400 miles. Whereas, if we did the Great Circle route, we're 3250. So, so going to the east first and then following the Great Circle across, that's about 150, 200 miles to the passage. However, hopefully we will be able to avoid ice and gales. Now, let's take a look at a few things here. Let's look at sea surface temperature. Now, so here we can see, if we go east first and then across, we're generally going to stay in warmer water. We're going to have some Gulf Stream currents, which will generally be favorable and get weaker as we work our way across. But generally, we should be in water that's at least 50 degrees. And just north of Bermuda, it's 70 degrees. We're in warm water there. So that'll keep us in warm water. And most likely, um, if we're in 60 degree water, we're not going to see any ice. Whereas, you see, if you go by Newfoundland, especially just uh, just east of Newfoundland, uh, you can see here you're, you're in ice water, 35 degrees. This is the Labrador current. And ice comes down. It flows down with this Labrador current. Um, I remember uh, years ago when I uh, sailed around Newfoundland with my dad. And uh, this was in July, early August. And this whole Strait of Belle Isle and the northeast coast of Newfoundland, it was just all ice. And so you don't dare sail at night. And, uh, and we did have radar, but even with radar, you have to be careful um, because... Sure, you'll pick up icebergs and bergy bits, but what you got to watch out for are the growlers or small pieces of ice that are too low down in the water 
for your radar to pick up, you, you, you'll just get lost in the sea return. Uh, but those growlers are big enough to punch a hole in your hull if you hit them going fast enough. So that said, we want to avoid ice. All right, so let's look at gales here. And let's back it up a little bit. These are the pilot charts. And uh, just briefly, pilot charts give you a lot of information on averages. So generally for five degree squares of ocean, they're giving you average wind, average number of comms. And in this box here, average number of gales recorded. So you can see it says in red here, Red numerals in each, uh, in the center of each five degree square insert. So the average percentage of ship reports in which, in which winds of at least force eight have been recorded for the month. And then we also have here extra tropical cyclones. The mean tracks of extra tropical cyclones are shown in red. So in April, you can say uh, for the great circle route, from Hatteras to Ireland, you're looking at 3%, 7%, 6 9 11 So generally, 5 to 10% of the time, you can expect to be in gale conditions, uh, at least in force 8, which is 34 to 40 knots of wind, and up. And you can also see these gale tracks. And pretty much, you're pretty much following the gale tracks. You can see this main gale track here, and then it curves to the north, but it looks like the dotted line is a secondary track, that's what I'm assuming. So if you cross in April, uh, you're pretty much following the gale track straight across the ocean, and uh, you can expect a fairly decent percent chance of getting into at least gale force conditions, if not worse. So let's march forward here. Let's look at May. So we're going to look at the exact same thing, except for May. Exact same thing being exact same area, the North Atlantic Ocean. Okay. So you can see if you leave in May. You can see there's still a primary gale track, which is pretty much the Great Circle route from Hatteras to Ireland. However, if you notice, the percentages have dropped. We're now down to about 2%, 3%, and then around here we're getting 7 6%, and uh, approaching the other side of the ocean, 5%. So the percentage of gales have dropped from 5 to 10%, say, down to... Uh, say about three to three to seven percent chance so you're still in the gale track but the probability of getting into gale force conditions is dropping so now let's move ahead to june since that's when we're actually planning to do this i just wanted to show those other months for comparison Now, as you can see in June, things are getting much better for us here. You can see right off Hatteras, we got some zeros there, which means very infrequently. And again, if we take this more southern route of going east and then the Great Circle across, you can see gale percentages are the highest box here is 3%. Most of the time, we're only about 1%, so fairly infrequent. And the other thing to note is look what happened to the gale track. Now it's moving way north, north of Newfoundland and Greenland. So generally everything is moving north with the sun. So June is definitely the best, uh, is definitely, well, compared to April and May, is a much better month to do this passage, even the Great Circle Route. But as we saw, uh, we can still, as the sailing directions say, we can still get into ice on the Great Circle Route 
and we'll probably be in very cold water. So, as I said, taking kind of this dog leg, which adds about 150, 200 miles, should keep us in warmer water, uh, favorable current, and hopefully out of bad weather. So hopefully we, we can avoid gales. Um, probably not going to be able to avoid gales altogether, but it, it's all it, it's all uh, it's all playing the odds here. So let's take a look at July, since if we leave early June, we probably wouldn't be there until probably take about a month to get across. So what are we looking at here in early July? Now here, well, <laughs> gale tracks have shifted south. Those might actually be hurricane. No, those are extra tropical. Um, however, however, you notice the percentage in July of gales has really dropped. You see, we're almost it's almost binary here. Uh, by then, we're pretty much down to ones and zeros. So. Um, it is showing that we will be still well, kind of south of the gale track there, but that the frequency of gales in July is very low. Uh, and that actually seems, July actually seems to be the lowest, um, overall percentage-wise, the lowest chance of encountering gales. Let's look at August here. And you can see August um, fairly low, but you can see the percentages of gales are starting to increase a bit in August, especially here on the eastern Atlantic. Uh, starting to pick up a little, but still not uh, not too bad. And uh, hopefully by end of August, then we'll be thinking about sailing south to northern Spain. And let's just take a look at September here. Um, now, as you can see, then just looking at September, now hopefully we'll, we'll be uh, we'll be on our way south by then. But you can see by September, now it's starting. The probabilities of gales are starting to rise again. So uh, September is when the North Atlantic is is beginning to get stormy again. Uh, but hopefully we'll be had on our way south or in. Uh, northern Spain by then. Um, so anyway, that's that's down the track. We'll cross that cross that ocean when we get to it. So while we're on the pilot charts, let's have a look at uh, average wind here. Let's look at these wind roses. So now I've backed it up to May. And so you can see off Hatteras in May, generally southwesterly winds, though not not terribly prevalent. And you can see we're kind of force four, force five. So still fairly, not force four, force five, so still fairly brisk. And as we work our way across, still force four, force five, more westerly though. Um, especially as you get up toward Ireland here. These are the westerlies in the higher latitudes. Those are more prevalent. Um, so let's move on to June. So here we are. Now you can see we get to June that the uh, the south and westerly winds right off of Hatteras here are getting much more prevalent. 
uh, remember the length of the the length of the arrow indicates is the relative percentage of the time that the wind is from that direction. So you can see in this area of the ocean from Hatteras to south of well to our turning point north of Bermuda, a very prevalent south to southwest wind. So that's all good. And then as we work our way across, again southwest and well and, and generally you can see easterlies are getting fairly rare here. You can see right around in here are these easterly, northeasterly arrows. Those are uh, those are pretty short. So winds from the east northeast are fairly rare, which is good because that's the direction we're going. We don't want we don't want east and northeast winds. We want south, west, and west. And that's generally what we're getting. Let's have a look at July here. And you can see in July, the southwesterlies are getting very prevalent. See, it has it written in here, 32, 33, 35. So when you add all these arrows up, that's probably at least 60, 70 percent of the time you're getting winds between south and west, and generally force four. So, so fairly nice conditions. And as we get across, so we get across here. Then you can see in the upper latitudes, approaching Ireland, the westerlies. To get further east there, it's the westerlies and northwesterlies become very prevalent. And again, uh, very, very little in the way of easterlies. So generally favorable wind and also little green arrows, generally favorable current. So, so that's all good. So moderate, uh, so hopefully on average, we should have moderate favorable winds some favorable current, and hopefully not too many gales all the way across.